Hey, welcome to the podcast, Jalen. Hey, bud. How you doing today? Pretty good. It feels like a lifetime since I've seen you. Uh, definitely, definitely. Likewise, <laughs> I can really relate to that. Um, it feels like the last time I saw you. You know, we were uh, we were running uh, three hundred yard gashers. Uh, <laughs> wow, man! It's it's it seems like a whole nother life. It's been what almost twenty years at this point. Almost, man. Almost. Jeez, I just remember you being like this young kid coming in almost looking like a, a gazelle like you're like six five finding your legs under you working out in the um weight room for a little bit but it's like it's good you you've grown up into a, a young man and you're living life on your terms thank you thank you for anyone who doesn't know you who do you say you are um you know um to be honest with you um i'm a real big teddy bear uh I'm not, I'm not like the visual that comes off as my representation. You know, everybody kind of sees me big and, you know, they think I'm this type of aggressive type of guy. I'm not. Um, genuinely, I was raised with a lot of love coming up, um, surrounded by a lot of different women uh, on my mother's side of the family. So uh, when it comes down to, you know, love, family, time, memories, um, I'm just a real homebody type of person. Um, I handle business whenever I'm in the, uh, I'm on the gridiron or, you know, I'm outside in the business world, but ultimately I'm a family person. Uh, I'm a guy that just loves to be around family and friends and enjoy life. That's awesome. And I, I can attest to that because it's funny because with football, they, they always want you to have that dog and that, that meanness about you. And it's like, just seeing that caring nature of you, I was like, this guy's all right. Appreciate it. Thank you. You know, you got to have an on and off switch to be able to turn it on and to keep it off because you can't take that type of mentality everywhere you go in life. Um, right. It does not equivalent or it does not, uh, you know, translate into, you know, better, um, you know, representation of yourself. You know, mm -hmm. ultimately that's just a mind frame and an ego that you have to go into whenever you're competing because you, you want to have that competitive nature and that upper hand, that drive. Mm. Good point. So tell me a little bit about how you grew up. Um, how'd you come to Dalton? Uh, first off, um, I grew up, uh, I grew up in the city at first Okay. and, uh, you know, my family was together. Um, uh, my parents were working both jobs. Uh, my mom, she had two jobs at the time. My dad was working in between Shaw. Um, I think he had like a 20 year tenure there. Hmm. And, uh, at the time my grandparents, uh, my grandfather had a, uh, construction business, uh, field with black hole bulldog. Mm -hmm. And I grew up all around equipment all my life, big trucks, heavy machinery, loud noises, uh, red dirt. It was just always something fun because, uh, yeah. for one, you know, as a little kid, when you see your grandfather with these big toys and he's doing all this type of demolition and stuff, you know, as a kid, you know, a natural, a kid's natural instinct is to get dirty, you know, mm -hmm. play in the mud and and break stuff. <laughs> so that so that's kind of that's kind of what he did. And uh, for me, it was kind of amusing. So, um, you know, through the years of him working, he actually had purchased a property out in the country, and uh, that became my forever home. Still is today. Mm -hmm. Um, I've been out there, I want to say I'm 32 now. I've been out there 20, 25 years of my life. Wow. Um, so it's been a blessing. Um, you know, we have our own property, two and a half acres. Um, mm -hmm. of course we grew up having dirt bike tracks, um, having equipment out there to do things. And, um, honestly being in the country really saved me. It, it kept me away from a lot of trouble in the inner city. Um, mm -hmm. fortunately, um, I didn't have to go through a lot of the poverty and adversity some of the other kids went through because, yeah. you know, of course we went to school with guys that were really less fortunate. Mm -hmm. um, but I was blessed really to have both parents, um, despite whatever it was that we went through and had to go through. Um, having both of them really defined me and kind of molded my character. Because um, uh, having a dad really does, it does mean something in this world today because there's a lot of guys out here that, that grow up without a, a role model or father figure to guide them. And uh, it makes their life kind of like, you know, it puts them a step behind where they need to be. Mm -hmm. But um, I grew up in the country. Um, I started off there. I went to Eastbrook, attended school there. Mm -hmm. And I started playing football. Um, ultimately, I'm be real with you. Uh, <laughs> I want to say my sixth grade year, I was I was pretty good. Um, but I was playing a position that I didn't really care too much for. Um, mm -hmm. I was playing right guard. Okay. And I never forget it. We had a guy named Trey Paris. You know, he was the running back. And I'd block for him. I'd be like the lead blocker. That always had me pulling because 
But when I was fast, I was quick to get around the edge. And, you know, I just find the first blocker and knock them out. Mm. And then uh, seventh grade year really changed for me. That's really whenever, you know, the wheels started turning and I started scratching the surface. Um, yep. They moved me to defensive end. And from that point on, I never really looked back. Um, I played two years at Eastbrook, um, actually three years at Eastbrook. And then my final year, um, we were transitioning from taking the uh, middle school kids to the high school to go train with them, you know, kind of get uh, acclimated to the playbook, the coaches. And right. what they did in the, in the county was they took Valley Point and Eastbrook and they bring the kids up to Southeast and try to integrate them to let them know, hey, you're going to be playing with this guy. Mm. You're both going to the same school and just trying to mold the teams together. And uh, at that time, I think Southeast had had a coaching change. Uh, they had a new coach, and uh, they wanted me to come up there and try out for them. And uh, they more or less gave me the reins to play in the position I wanted to play. Right. Um, I had actually played in an all-star game, and I played against uh, I played against a few guys from Dalton, and uh, they blew us out. Of course, they had Shaquan Moore. They had Striker for <laughs> Had Striker Brown, Cameron Washington, uh, Christian Washington. Um, they, to be honest with you, they had the whole Washington family over there. Yeah. Uh, so uh, <laughs> they 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 done us pretty rough, but uh, ultimately I had a heck of a game. I can't remember how many tackles I had, but it I had such an impact on that game where Coach Ronnie McClure came down and talked to me himself mm -hmm. um, as an eighth grader, and he told me he wanted me at Dalton and. Mm -hmm. Um, my dad was really good friends with uh, Striker Brown's father, Kim Brown, across the dog. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had talked. Um, they had tried to see what they could do to get me to come to Dalton. And then uh, I just remember my next year, start of ninth grade year, um, mm -hmm. it was a big debate because I ended up going to, I think, Southeast for like maybe a day or so. Yeah. And then I went to Dalton and then they kind of like pulled me back and said I couldn't come over. Mm -hmm. So I had to wait. I think I, I think I wait. I don't know how long it was I waited, but initially everything got worked out, and then I started going to school at Dalton ninth grade year, mm. and uh, that's how I come across you um, guys. I mean, you to be honest with you, you guys were like, I loved you guys, and I still do. Um, you guys are like brothers to me. Um, Preston Keg, you, um, uh, Jake McIntosh, um, uh, DJ Lashley. Remember DJ? Yeah. Um, I hadn't, um, I hadn't heard so many of these names in a while. It's like it's, you're just reminding me of people I need to reach out to and just be like, I wonder where this person's at. Yeah, man. Uh, Andrew Palmer. I mean, Palmer used to give me, he used to give me fits <laughs> every day in practice. You know, you know how he was. You know, when yeah. coach would say, uh, coach would say, light him up, wake him up. You know, he was the first person. <laughs> you had to turn around and look for where he's he coming from because you know yeah. he's about to get knocked out. And uh, I got there and. Uh, that's really just why I enrolled in Dalton. Things started clicking for me a little bit. Of course, you know, playing freshman ball uh, with all the guys that were already on the eighth grade team, I had to kind of get acclimated to them. Mm -hmm. And uh, over time, I just kind of fit in with the guys. Um, I started to gel more. Um, I didn't really hang out with everybody as much because, for one, you know, my living circumstances, I lived, I lived out of the county. I mean, I lived out of the city limits. So mm -hmm. uh, it kept me from really, like, rubbing elbows with the guys. But gotcha. I was always within – running or walking distance from the recreation center. So anytime I didn't have anything to do on Saturday, I'd go shoot basketball with some of the guys and hang out. And over time, that's how I started getting, you know, more um, acquisition with everyone. Wow. And I, I never knew, like, your story. It's like, like you kind of say, I knew that we played football together and that was about it. And it's having, I guess at the time, we're two years apart. So your freshman year is my junior year. And right. Kind of trying to figure out like what's really going on and kind of seeing where like having an understanding of football and maybe watching things like um Deion sanders now coach prime out in colorado and seeing a lot of the fuss that people make about college football high school football and just seeing like the what goes into it it's like oh okay like this isn't something new but what people choose to pay attention to at times is like there's a little bit more to the story it's not just like People don't just do random things, but to your point, it, it's good to see someone that has their parents in their life and the impact that that had on you. And then also like what you're able to grow from that and like continue to do the best that you could with what you had, where you went. Right. Definitely. Definitely. You 
know, I was very fortunate for that. And uh, really, um, I say the group of juniors and seniors my freshman year, mm -hmm. um, there was not a group like it, you know. In your class, you had uh, you had Harrison Scott. Yeah. Um, you had uh, not not Trip, but uh, who was that? Uh, goodness. Was this true? Or... No, you had Kareem. Oh you yeah, Kareem, Kareem Hawkins. Hawkins. Yeah. Um, you had a. Uh... No, was Carter in your class? Carter Kirkfield. He was in the class um, Before after you. me. Yeah, so he's after. he's in between us. Yeah. Yeah, you, so I mean, think you Carter have... went in and, and filled in for Harrison as quarterback, and yep. I think he played yeah. DB as well. He did. He played free safety. Yeah, that's right. I, I never forget that. We we had a really solid group, man. Um, between between that old that old nine and oh eight group, mm -hmm. um, there wasn't nothing like it. Um, we had so much talent. Um, yeah. really, we were super talented. I mean, we were. By size, we were out of the average. Um, yeah. You know, of course, rest in peace. You know, we had Andre Johnson. Mm. Um, he was a big, very focal point on defense. Um, we had Henry Myers on the other side. Yeah. Um, oh yeah. I remember had, Henry. Uh, before before yeah. that, we had a uh, um, Kelly story. I don't think yeah. if you ever got to meet him. No, I don't think so. Gotcha. I think he went down to Rome, Georgia. After a little bit, family had to move, and that that was another one of those things where it's like. Like football wasn't my best sport, but I, I just remember like the time you spend together after school and summer camp and all of that. It's hard to walk away from something, even if it's like you're not good at it and you don't realize the the levels to the game where it's like you've got to play in a certain way or you've got to. Um, you, you've got to kind of be in the know to know, like, OK, this is going to work for me, like I'm either going to be a training dummy <laughs> all the way up until my senior year, or I'm going to be a starter and either that's going to help me or it's going to hurt me in the long run. Right. Right. Well, ultimately, man, you know, uh, no matter what you go through out on the field, whether you, whether you start or you sit, um, mm -hmm. even the smallest amount of playing time you get out there, um, regardless, um, that stuff, it teaches you about life. Um, it yeah. builds you, it builds your character. Um, those hard days to practice, um, there were days where we wanted to give up. Um, probably wanted to quit, want to yeah. walk away. Um <laughs> especially after conditioning. Um there's a lot of times I won't lie to you. Um I was I was at my point where like, God, are you serious? Like how many more hundred yards we gotta run? Yeah. And uh you know it honestly it prepared me for you know ups and downs in life, travel tribulations. Um not everything was gonna go my way. Mm -hmm. And that is something that I've kind of profoundly had an understanding over time um mm. knowing that you know football is a game of life and if you can do anything out there you can persevere you can fight through adversity um yeah. you know the saying it says you know fall down nine times get back up ten um that's ultimately what it's about and it just pushes you to be a different person um much better much more stronger and sufficient for yourself and uh I feel like no matter where you are, um, there were guys that never even really got to play at all. Yeah. But um, the game itself uh, brought them so much, not only just camaraderie, but it taught them different morals that they need to establish for themselves to be successful. Yeah. And I think truly that's what it taught me. You know, had I never started the game or not, um, or played at all, I think truly, you know, it would have taught me a lot, you know, mm -hmm. just fighting day in and day out. Because, you know, we had, what, two a days? I, yeah. I think we had three days at one point, you know. Um, I remember one time we were in the gym, I believe. We had camp in the gym. Mm -hmm. um, and then the very following year, we went to Bell Local. Yeah. Because um, I think that had some something happened one year where we just couldn't go to Bell Local. So we we, we had practice at the uh, at Dalton, at the facility. Right. We were sleeping inside the gym. Mm. So I remember that uh, vividly. You know, um, I think those moments right there, is what brought people together. Um, it really showed you who wanted to be here and who didn't. Right. And I don't, and I don't really recall at all over my years uh, being out there. I probably can maybe count maybe, maybe on one hand how many people actually quit mm. um, throughout all four years of my you know tenure there. Yeah. And that says a lot. Um, that shows that there's a lot of guys out there that were willing to sacrifice. Mm. So ultimately, man, uh, it just it, it taught me a lot. Um, yeah. I was really blessed to have you guys 
Um, I enjoyed being around the seniors and the juniors because I learned so much from you guys. Wow. Of course, you, you know, y'all had trash talk, you know, so I picked up some there. <laughs> what? But, trash talk? What are you talking about? <laughs> trash talk, yeah. You know, I um, remember, uh, I remember you, uh, when I had to come to tight end for a little bit, you know, mm -hmm. you would help me with my routes and whatnot. And then, uh, you know, I won't lie, I dropped a few, I dropped a few open passes because I was worried about running mm -hmm. football. And I started catching some, but, uh, you know, I remember sometimes somebody said, hey, brick hands. <laughs> That's so kind of right. when, I figured out, when I figured out, I said, okay, I need to go to defense. Yeah. So it's like defense was definitely your, your strong suit overall. Yeah. yeah Cause um, you know, honestly, I'm a, I'm a reactive person. I don't really like to, I, I can think, mm -hmm. um, but whenever you're honestly, whenever you're thinking about stuff on the field, like how many yards you have to run out on the dig or if the linebacker says here, you need to float over here to the middle of the field. Yeah. You know, if you think about all that stuff, you're thinking, you're not actually playing. Right. And when you're on defense, you know your assignment. Like Coach Bennett used to tell me, you know, assignment, alignment, mm -hmm. just go. And uh, having that mindset of them just letting you loose mm -hmm. and pinning your ears back, that was just the best feeling in the world because I didn't have to worry about anything. All I had to do was react to what came my way. Yeah, I didn't have to worry about secondary play or if, if this happened, I need to flare out to the flats. Nothing like that. Just go get the ball, wherever the ball's at. Yeah, and and that's what made me play so fast, and made it so easy for me. Yeah, that's a good point because it's like defenders are usually known as like the dogs on the field. It's like you just sniff out where the ball's at, where the play's at, and you just get after it. Exactly. Awesome. So then, from from high school, when you were going through that process, where'd you go from there? Uh, from high school, um, a lot of people don't know this. Um, I. Uh, I uh, signed a dual scholarship. Um, mm -hmm. I signed a scholarship to Georgia Military College, which mm -hmm. is in Milledgeville, um, Middle Georgia. Yeah. Um, and that is Baldwin County. Mm -hmm. um, I signed a scholarship there, and I signed my National Letter of Intent to University of Georgia. Um, oh, wow. Weeks leading up to the proceeding, um, and it was heartbreaking for me. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I even wrote it in my news article when the Daily Citizen interviewed me. Um, I was in my room, and uh, at the time, I had been talking to, I think, Ms. Freeman and Mr. Ward. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they were encouraging me highly. They were helping me the best they could as far as academics. Mm -hmm. um, I kind of got behind in the math course. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I struggled there a little bit because math was never just, it wasn't, now it is, you know, yeah. now I could I could do anything. But huh. before then, when it comes to like Y equals MX plus B and quadratic equations and stuff, it just, that was rocket scientist to me. Yeah. Um, so, I struggled with it and uh, I ended up passing, coming back and passing my courses. But the biggest thing was me for um, to uh, pass the SAT. I had to require a certain score because, you know, my first two years, you know, I didn't I didn't take academics as, as strong as what I needed to my junior and senior. Year. Mm -hmm. um, my first scholarship that I got was from Philip Fulmer, University of Tennessee, while he was still there. Um, okay. He offered me a scholarship. Um, he actually came to Dalton. Uh, came to Coach McClure's office and I shook his hand and met him and he offered me a scholarship right in there. And I couldn't believe it. You know, I was in shock. Um, that's kind of whenever I started to try to apply myself a little bit more. Right. So initially my senior year, I was making up for mistakes that I made my freshman and sophomore year. I was catching up. Uh, I was trying to, you know, polish up that GPA, make it look, you know, a little bit much more, you know, presentable. Right. And uh, my SAT came back. I took an ACT and I took two SATs mm -hmm. and I wanted to take one more test, but I couldn't get scheduled in time enough for it because I wanted to take as many as I could to be able to pass right. to go and enroll on campus at Georgia. And uh, I kid you not, my results come back. And from what my GPA was, I was 40 points short of what I needed to make in order to, get, to enroll at Georgia. Mm -hmm. So uh, had I passed that, I would have never, ever, um, you know, went to Georgia Military College. I would have I would have went straight into Athens. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there on, um, I graduated. Um, I had a all-star game. It was the uh, the North and South all-star game. We played mm -hmm. it at, uh, we played it, I think we played at Macaulay. Yeah, we played at Macaulay. And uh, I won the MVP that night. Um, I think I had like 10 tackles. I might be like a sack, a force fumble or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I won the MVP that night. And I just remembered the 
the next two nights, um, I had to get prepared because that day was my birthday. Um, mm. And I had to enroll on campus on Monday. Mm. So I had less than 48 hours to celebrate, you know, on my birthday, mm. win the MVP, and then and go enroll in college. And I was mm. nervous. I won't lie to you. Um, yeah. You know, leaving home and my comfort zone, um, it scared me a little bit because I didn't know what to expect. Mm -hmm. um, I knew there were going to be people from all sorts of life around there. So uh, me and my parents, we got to the house. We discussed things. We talked. Um, Georgia Military College, they sent me a list of what I needed to bring. Mm -hmm. um, you couldn't you couldn't bring a TV. Uh, mm -hmm. You you could only bring a foot locker, like a military foot locker. Yeah. Um, you could have a small refrigerator. You could have food and snacks in there. Mm -hmm. um, of course, you could bring your laptop and stuff. And and over time, they initially changed the rules where you could bring a TV. Mm -hmm. um, this had to be a certain size because it couldn't be no bigger than what was required in the room. Mm -hmm. and, uh, I packed up Sunday night on the 13th, and then Monday on the 14th, me, my mom, my dad, my uncle, and my brother, we drove to Millersville, Georgia, mm -hmm. and uh, had a truck loaded. My mom followed us in the car, um, got down there, got unloaded, got in my room. Um, I started meeting people out there. Um, I got on campus, and I'd probably say they stood there maybe about three and a half hours, maybe four hours. Uh, gave me a hug, kissed me goodbye, said said our goodbyes. Mm -hmm. um, get, had my cell phone, make sure I had everybody's numbers. And that moment on, um, I began my, my journey uh, by myself on campus. Wow. And uh, you want to talk about an experience, man. Um, that was something that was life-changing. Because um, they uh, they have this period, it's called plea period, mm -hmm. where you're literally wearing like a reflector belt and like a GMC battalion shirt. So we mm -hmm. were the fourth battalion, so we had to wear a yellow shirt. Mm -hmm. And immediately after our parents left, um, we were in street clothes. So they called us down to the bricks for formation. You know, and I've never been in the military. I don't, I don't know formation. I don't know what to expect. Right. So we get down there and they tell us, you know, everybody had attention, stand like this. So we're standing on the bricks. Our parents are watching. Our parents leave. Um, I want to say they like, let us go back to our rooms. We go up there maybe two or three hours. And then finally, um, they bring us clothes, shorts, and shirts to change into. Mm -hmm. uh, we went to sleep that night. And I remember the next morning uh, being woke up at 5.45 in the morning. Get up. Get up. Get up. Everybody's running out the door like, you know, it's a fire alarm going off or something. Mm -hmm. And we're on the bricks in formation, freezing cold because so early. And yeah. we're doing like we're doing military drills. We're marching. We're doing about face, right face, left face, at mm -hmm. ease. Um, and their favorite thing to do is put you in the front lean and right position. <laughs> and that's and that's to make you do push ups. Yeah. So uh, so we we done that for a while. And uh, it woke me up. It was like, OK, this is going to be my life now. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's kind of really when I got the wake up calls in college. Mm -hmm. I guess how how did you feel beforehand? Were you just kind of like floating through life, or life was pretty easy for you, or you didn't really have to worry about a whole lot? Um, at, you know, at the time, you know, of course, you had high school graduation, mm -hmm. so we had to say goodbyes to all our friends. Everybody wanted to meet up and hang out a few last times before everybody's life started. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like I was floating through life, but um, I was going through a transition period. Um, mm -hmm. I told myself, you know, I can make it through this. Yeah. I'll be a man. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when I got down there, it was just like, okay, is this really what I want to do? I started questioning myself. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I almost I almost called home a few times and said, you know what, I'm just coming home. Yeah. Which, which my parents probably wouldn't have came and got me, but <laughs> I would have said, you stay down there. But yeah. uh, I, I questioned myself, should I really be doing this? And I thought about leaving. And for some reason, you know, I just had this will and this nature and this drive to, you know, pull myself through it. So I did. Yeah. And uh, it was rough. Football workouts were intense. Um, the training, the regiment, all the running. I mean, I thought we ran in high school. Yeah. Wow. It's light years compared to what we ran here. We used to run, we used to run 31 tens. What are um, those? Well, well, you get down to the end zone and you run mm -hmm. all the way through the other end zone and okay. you jog back, jog back down. So we do 30 of those. We do heel runs. Uh, we do, for punishment, you have to do bar patrol. Uh, you get a 45-pound bar. 
mm-hmm. and you hold it over, you hold it over your head, and you hold it as long as you can. You do squats, you do mm-hmm. lunges with it, and over time, man, your arms they just they get they turn into noodles. Yeah, and uh, it's a uh, it was tough. It was tough. My my head coach, uh, rest in peace, Burt Williams, um, probably one of the best head coaches I had in a long time. Um, he uh, he put a lot of time and effort into me, uh, into me making me better. Uh, he pushed me. Um, when we used to run sprints, um, I didn't even run sprints with a defensive lineman. I used to run with the running backs, mm. running backs and linebackers. Uh, so, you know, these guys are running four fours, four fives. Yeah. And I'm right there leading the pack with them, you know. So um, that proved a lot to me that I could do it. Like, okay, you know, I could really keep up with these guys. And physically, um, I was in better shape than a lot of the defensive linemen that I, that I played with. Mm. You know, a lot of these guys that were getting gassed out, they were getting tired. They couldn't make it through the runs. And, uh, you know, I, I say that being at Dalton and playing under Coach Weingarten and Coach McClure and having Coach Bennett as the coordinator and having Scott Thompson, mm-hmm. you know, as, <laughs> as, your, as your straight conditioning coach, you know, yeah. uh, it helped a whole lot when I got to college because, uh, you know, I was pretty much a step ahead of these guys yeah. when it comes to certain things. Because, you know, we'd run sprints and these guys are hands on their knees, squatted down, laid down. Some guys throwing up. And I'm just over there with my hands on my head, standing up. You know, and I looked around and I was like, well, okay, I, I might be able to do this. You know, yeah. I feel a little confident here, you know. Gotcha. So, uh, so that was a, that was a big step right there. And then I kind of realized, okay, I'm not floating through life anymore. I'm actually doing this. Mm. I'm going to, I'm going to establish myself here. I'm going to study. I'm going to train hard. Um, I'm going to keep up my academics. Um, mm. I was very proud of myself because both years there, you know, I maintained a 3.5 GPA. Nice. Um I made all honors. Um, then I graduated, had my uh, associate's degree there. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was another big step for me too. I was so happy to have that that paper, that degree, mm-hmm. um, just to see my name on it, to say that you know that I done that. Um, it was probably one of the biggest accomplishments of my life because wow. uh, in my in my immediate family, besides my uncle, I'm the only other person in my family that's got a degree and education like that. Mm-hmm. What did you study while you were there? Um, I studied criminal justice, and my minor was in general studies. Okay. And, uh, so I had a lot of uh, I had a lot of CJ classes, mm-hmm. um, like Homeland Security one hundred and one, um, defensive. Uh, um, what was it? Uh, it was like a class called defensive congestures. It was a weird name, but. Um, okay. I guess whenever you're in military college, they have these different names for courses or whatnot, but some of them sounded like they didn't even really make any sense, but they actually taught you different things. Um, I learned the ins and outs of, you know, the laws, um, the legal system between legislation and and the justice system. So uh, a lot of that stuff was kind of in the background in the sense of my family. You know, I got an uncle that's a a federal agent. I got another uncle that's a... uh, Chief of Police for State Troopers, I believe. Mm-hmm. And uh, the list goes on. We've got a deep lineage of people in my family that do different things. So uh, I kind of wanted to, to base it somewhat around there. And honestly, um, Bonaparte, um, his father, yeah. um, big Bonaparte, he was kind of the big reason why I chose that route to go into criminal justice. You know, mm-hmm. he told me to he told me to go that route. He told me if I wanted to be a state trooper, I could yeah. do that, you know. And I thought about it at the time, but as years went on, I've seen that, you know, their job has got a lot much more and safer because uh, in this day and age, you know, a lot of people don't like to get pulled over and mm-hmm. everyone's carrying a gun these days. Yeah. So it's it's kind of, it's kind of scary to be out there on the, on the force in the field, knowing mm-hmm. that there's a possibility you may not make it home that night. All right. So ultimately I kind of, when I got to my four year school, I changed my, my degree. I changed uh, what I wanted to major in my degree, mm-hmm. and I went back to I went back to general studies, and then I minored in criminal justice because mm-hmm. I wanted to have just general knowledge of everything. Nice. So, where'd you decide to go once you you got your associates? Um, for my associates, I was supposed to still go to Georgia, mm-hmm. um, but they wanted me to be there in the winter time. Yeah, and uh, I had talked to Coach Todd Grantham, the defense coordinator at the time. He wanted me to be there around January. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't able to because at the time um, I had a math course in college that was that was tough on me that I mm-hmm. that I just couldn't pass then. So I went back and I took it again and I passed it. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, at the time, I had a recruitment open up. Um, Auburn offered me a school, uh, full scho- full ride scholarship. Mm-hmm. Um, Marshall offered me a scholarship. Um, I actually I flew to Marshall, and mm-hmm. I liked it. Um, I went out there to uh, Huntington, West Virginia, and it was a uh, it was cold, but uh, <laughs> it was pretty cool. Um, you know, being up there in the mountains, um, mm-hmm. I was like, all right, you know, this might kind of be the fit for me. And then I visited Louisiana mm-hmm. and Louisiana just kind of sold me really just based off of um, the people, the culture, yeah. um, the coaches, um, mm-hmm. all that stuff, uh, the food. Yes, <laughs> definitely. I was like, I'm a big guy. I got to <laughs> I got to eat good. I got to try me some uh, crawdads mm-hmm. and some shrimp po' boys. And some boudin. lo and behold, when I got there, you know, uh, that's all it was. Um, my coaches, which – I don't I don't say this now, but you know, I know they got NIL deals now, mm-hmm. but uh my coach. But at the time I couldn't really say anything about it, but there's so much going on now that you really can't worry about it. But uh right. at the time my coaches they paid for me a vehicle. Um they uh put me in a hotel room for two and a half months and pretty much paid ten grand uh, on the room for me. Um every day. I'd go to like I was going to uh, Louisiana Technical College. Mm-hmm. And I was I was doing a computer class because they they had me leave uh, Georgia Military College a month and a half in advance of my graduation time. So I graduated. I got my degree when I was in Louisiana. Yeah. Um, they just went ahead and flew me out there. Well, I drove out there, mm-hmm. moved in, and put my stuff in a storage container. And uh, they were waiting for my apartment to get ready in May, mm-hmm. and then I could move and put all my stuff in there. So they put me in a hotel room for two and a half months. Uh, pay for everything. Um, mm-hmm. They furnished the food, everything. Um, all I had to do was go to class. Um, I wasn't doing any workouts then because workouts didn't begin until I couldn't work out with the team until May. Mm-hmm. So uh, I stayed there, um, studied, 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 got my degree. And that's pretty much it. Then after that, you know, I had transitioned to go to practice and whatnot. Mm-hmm. But uh, for that time period that I was there, it was. Uh, Every day, it was steaks, mm. hamburgers, <laughs> hot dogs, um, chicken. Um, I really got uh, acquainted with raising canes. Um, mm. You know, they were there all the time. So uh, I think the first complimentary trade they brought me was they bought me like a, a 10 by 20 pan of nothing but fries, seasoned fries. Jeez. And then they bought they bought another 10 by 20 pan full of 100 chicken tenders. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, no, no lie. I can't make that up. And I right. sat there in the room and I was just like, man, I'm going to get sick. So uh, it was pretty neat. Um, I had good coaches there. Um, mm-hmm. Coach uh, Coach Saunders, um, he's the one that recruited me. Um, I met his son, Riley, which is a good buddy of mine. We're still great buddies to this day. Mm-hmm. Uh, but uh, he recruited me to come there. He actually flew on the plane, um, come to Millersville. Mm-hmm. At the time, I was staying off campus because um, I was married then. And uh, he came to sit down with me. Uh, he was like, you want to go eat somewhere? I was like, sure. Mm-hmm. And so you pick a place. I was like, what? I said, you know, we're in Millersville. There's not too much to go do around here. Mm-hmm. So he went to Chili's and sat down. Um, we watched the game. Um, he offered me a scholarship. He told me how bad they wanted me to come there. He said, can we schedule you a visit? Can you come see us? I said, sure thing. So I drove down there in a rental car. Uh, they paid for the rental car and everything. Mm-hmm. I drove down there. And I took a tour of campus. I met Coach uh, Coach Husband, mm-hmm. uh, my defensive coordinator, um, Coach Stoops. Um, and then I met my defensive line coach, Coach Tim Edwards. Mm-hmm. And from then on, I was just sold on that place. Um, they said a lot of great stuff to me. They showed me a lot of great stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, the only thing I wasn't too sold on really was the defensive scheme. Um, mm-hmm. I didn't care too much for the 3-4. I didn't. Um, I wanted to play in a four three. Yeah. Four three is four three is when you've got actual dogs. Mm-hmm. Uh, you got a guy that can beat the guy in front of a one on one. When you right. play three four, you're playing gap assignment defense, pretty mm-hmm. much for linebackers to make the play. Right. And I wanted to be in a system that allowed me to get out there and make plays myself. Mm-hmm. Which, you know, granted I did, but uh that was what sold me on going to Louisiana. So mm-hmm. when I got there, uh enrolled in the, the college. I got my degree, and then summer workouts came. Yeah. And uh, when summer workouts came, I actually I got sick 
Um, I didn't know. I, I had been sick for about three or four weeks. Mm. And I was finally, uh, I went to the nurse to go get checked out. And uh, she told me that I needed to go see a GI. Mm. I didn't know what that meant. Mm. So I went to go see a gastrointelligent. Mm. And we done, we done a magnesium test on me and found out that my, uh, my gallbladder was ruptured. So I had to have gallbladder surgery. Um, I want to say a week and a half later. Mm -hmm. And that was quite an experience too, because I'd never been put to sleep. Um, Mm -hmm. I kid you not, I was crying. Um, Mm -hmm. My coaches came in there and he gave me like a, a, a 1953 ancient buffalo nickel. Mm-hmm. It's supposed to be like good luck. Yeah. And uh, I went there. I went laid down. I got prepped, put the IVs in. And the last thing I remember was saying my saying to everybody in the room, I loved him. I went mm-hmm. out. When I woke up, uh, the pain was excruciating. Um, mm-hmm. They said in the middle of surgery, um, I stood up. I looked around, looked at, looked at both the doctors while they had my stomach open. And I said something to one of them, and they were like, hey, you got to give them 50 more cc's, put them back out. Mm-hmm. So they put me out. So they actually over-injected me um, as far as, um, you know, the uh, the anesthesia. And then when I woke up, uh, the feeling was awful. Um, mm-hmm. I, I threw up. I was really nauseous. Um, I couldn't keep my head up. I just kept falling asleep. And they kept... They, you know, doctors, they got to rub your chest to keep you up because yeah. it's, it's part of the protocol. They don't want you to, like, you know, go in a DOA. Mm. And uh, I don't know. It was quite the experience. Uh, it, it it scared me because I was only there with my wife at the time, and uh, my parents were not there. So mm. all I had was her to rely on, and, and that was nervous enough, you know, yeah. because I'm by myself going through it. So it was a it was an experience. It was. Mm. I didn't I didn't expect to get sick. You know, especially right after I got on campus. But right. but after that, you know, I got better. I healed a little bit, and uh, you know, things started clicking. Mm. You felt you felt much better once you you had the surgery and all that. Oh, definitely. The only thing that was uh, rough was you know you're in Louisiana. Mm-hmm. Everything's spicy. Everything's hot. Mm-hmm. And if you lose a gallbladder, anybody knows anything about that. You cannot ingest spices or hot foods. Mm-hmm. So for a while, it was. Campbell's chicken noodle soup, peanut butter jelly sandwiches, uh, real cheese sandwiches, just things that didn't have, you know, spice to kind of tear my insides up. Right. But uh, when it healed up, you know, I I couldn't resist. You know, I had to go try something. So mm-hmm. I started, I had to teach my digestive tract to work around, um, you know, its deficiencies. So that mm-hmm. my gallbladder, my gallbladder is like a filter. Mm-hmm. So I really don't have a filter to filter anything now. I just more or less mm-hmm. ingest it and it does what it does. Right. So I trained myself by eating small portions and over time I got better. Mm-hmm. So then I was able to actually, you know, eat and you know go on with daily life. Gotcha. But the first month and a half, uh, it was awful. Um mm-hmm. anything I ate was just burning me up inside. I couldn't deal with it. I was having pain. Um and I didn't really rely on medication. Um mm-hmm. my doctor was actually kind of mad at me that I didn't, you know, take as much of the medication that I needed to. You know me. I was trying to be a tough guy and try to fight it out, right. but ultimately, a pain of that level, um, it's kind of hard to go against the grain there. Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is the the start of your junior year. Yes, right. about my junior year. Yeah. So it's like, what, what did it feel like playing on that college level? I guess you're D two at this point, or um, do you ever play uh, any D D one schools? Uh, no, I was I was D one. I was D one okay. there. Gotcha. Um, we were we were in the Sunbelt Conference. Mm. Um, first game of the year was uh, Lamar. Mm. I missed the game. Second game of the year was Troy mm. on ESPN two. And uh, I kid you not, the coaches that were doing everything they could to get me to play. Um, I wanted to play, but I just mm. didn't know how I was going to hold up because mm. I still had I still had a hole in my stomach. But I still yep. had like had sutures that were covering it up, Ooh. healing, but it wasn't fully healed. So uh, my coach, he went and they paid, I think maybe like two or three grand, got me a fiberglass shield to go over my chest, mm. and they had me a custom Nike compression shirt that you slide this protective shield in. Mm. And it's almost like it's almost like a flak jacket, like what quarterbacks wear. 
Yeah. And you put it right there in your ribs. So they made that for me and they want me to play. So I was doing workouts. I was conditioning. Mm-hmm. Um, still was kind of like a partial hole in my stomach. I just had to be real careful. Every mm-hmm. day after practice, I'd wipe it down, clean it up. Um, you know, my staff would clean me up, make sure I was okay. I'd take a shower. Um, you know, I'd put antibiotics and stuff around it, keep it clean, and mm-hmm. change, make sure I change goggles. And then uh, it started healing a little bit better and better every time. So the week comes up, and, you know, everybody's expecting, like, they want to see my debut. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were like, you know, is he going to play this year or what? Like, what's going on? Um, so my coach is like, well, Jalen, he said, you're going to play this week. And I said, I am. I'm going to play this week. He said, yeah. He said, you're going to fly. You're going to travel out with us. So I traveled out with the team. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know. I was in the uh, I was in the second string rotation. Mm-hmm. Um, defensive line, we rotate all the time. So there's always fresh legs. So there was a high chance of me playing, but I didn't think so just because – you know, I thought they might want to preserve me, but I dressed out. Mm-hmm. Um, I went through warm-ups with the team out there on the field. Um, we got in the hotel room. We did warm-ups there. Um, then we went to the field. Um, when we got there, um, the Troy fans are crazy. Um, they were throwing bottles at us on the football field. Like, it's, it's college game day now. Yeah. Like, ESPN2 is there. They're recording it. And these guys are calling us out of our names, talking about our moms. Mm. Uh, I mean – Anything you can name or you can think of, Ash, um, they honestly done it. Um, yeah. I even had a guy spit on me. Um, uh, luckily, I had my helmet on, but uh, a yeah. guy, guy spit on me. And I turned around and I just, you know, of course, you know me, I, I gave a little back talk to him. But, uh, you know, I kept it I kept it like I was supposed to, civilized, and went mm-hmm. out and trained, uh, went through our drills or slants or get-offs, mm-hmm. went back in the locker room, um, I was warmed up. I was hydrating, stretching still. Um, we come out through the tunnel, come out to the field. Game starts. Lights, camera, action. They're, they're full. They're sold out over there. We're sold out on our side. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's probably around 40,000 fans in there. And uh, that's the most I've ever seen. So I was shocked. I was like, whoa, this is crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I waited my turn. I sat on the bench, sat on the sidelines. Um, my defensive line coach, he was big on us following him. Everywhere the chain was at, where the ball was at, he wanted the defensive line to walk with him in case mm-hmm. he wanted to so, so a few series goes in, goes on. You know, we're stopping them defensively. Offense, we get out there, we score a touchdown. He's like, uh, David, I want you to get in. And he caught my name, and I just kind of like looked at him surprised, like, what? Like, you want me to get in there? I'm like, okay. You know, this is my first taste of college football. Mm-hmm. So I get out there. Um, the first play is like a, a strong side slant. Um, I was on the weak side, mm-hmm. so I had to slant away from the ball. Um, I, I did a few two. Uh, we went a few series. You know, we got out there, we chased them down. Um, you know, I had a few quarterback pressures, and then uh, the second series I got in. That's when I made my first welcome to college big play. Mm-hmm. Um, that's pretty neat. He was like, "If you get back there, Jalen," he said, "You sack that quarterback." I want you to look up at the camera and wave at the defense court, wave at the offensive coordinator over there. And lo and behold, um, the next play that I was in, um, I I got down. I was in a four point stance. Mm-hmm. I got off. Had a quick get off. I bull rushed the guy. I hit him with like a, a inside arm combo, mm-hmm. and then I came back with my my outer arm and swam up underneath it. Mm-hmm. Quarterback's holding the ball. He's looking around. I literally took his head off. Boom. Um, I hit him, mm-hmm. and when I hit him, I ran right through him. I hit him. I touched the ground for a second, and I got back up so quick. I didn't even feel like I'd done anything. And the play happened so quick that I felt like I didn't even make a play. Mm-hmm. So I turned around, and the first thing I did was I looked at the, I looked at the, uh, the press box, and I waved at the office coordinator. Mm-hmm. And that was my first big welcome to college play. So mm-hmm. I had a, I had a sack, and I had. I had three tackles, and then I had two assists. First college game. And I was playing with a hole in my stomach at the time. So whenever I'd done that, that surprised me. I was like, okay, I can do this. Yeah. I can do this. You know, so I, you keep uh, leveling up. Exactly. Keep leveling up. And uh, that gave me confidence for the rest of the season, um, especially when we played Florida later on in that season, you know, because mm-hmm. uh, we should have beat Florida. We went down to the swamp, and it was 20 to 20. Mm-hmm. And they blocked the punt. 
and that's how they beat us. They were they were actually going to get beat on homecoming by us. Man. They paid us. They paid us a million dollars to come down there and play them, and they almost lost. Man. So, uh, so from that that point on, from that Troy game, my confidence level just got better and better. Yeah, that's amazing, man. And and I guess when you were at, at um, Georgia Military College in Milledgeville, did you not play football there, or? Oh, I, I did. Um, gotcha. There, um, I was a dog there. Uh, my freshman year, um, I was one of the only freshmen to be out there on the field starting. Um, mm -hmm. I had a coach named Coach Coons, a uh, northern guy. Mm -hmm. uh, he was from uh, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. And, you know, anything about northerns, man, they're really bold. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, he'll tell you what he feels, how he mm -hmm. thinks. You like it, you know. If you don't, then he probably loves it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, he was uh, really open. Uh, he he cussed me out. He he'd take me on his wing, talk to me, but he was like a father figure to me. Mm -hmm. Um, I I got another coach my my sophomore year, and that coach happened to coach my my uncle. Mm -hmm. uh, his name was a uh, Coach Hill. He was a defense line coach at Union College in Virginia. Yeah, he used to coach he used to coach my uncle. So he come my uh, sophomore year, but my freshman year, from the changes of coaches, mm -hmm. you know, I had a coach that. Let me pin my ears back and let me go anytime I wanted to. Mm -hmm. Then I had a coach that made me play within a different structure. So that changed that changed my my projectile a little bit because Coach Coons, he was like, just as long as you squeeze that line mm -hmm. and you make the and you make the play, you get to the ball. He said, I don't give a damn. You know, you go get the ball. Yeah. And I love that about him because, you know, regardless if I made a mistake, if I made it full speed, it wasn't a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, and with Coach Hill. You know, he was he was more adamant on, you know, slanting the right way, you know, getting the gaps, making sure the linebackers get free to make a play, you know, mm -hmm. uh you know, make sure you hit your A gap or your B gap. And Coach Coons was more on the edge of just just go. Yeah. You know, the same mentality that I had at Dalton, just go. And that's what I loved about him. So um my freshman year at GMC, I probably had, I don't know, I know I had 45 plus tackles. Um I had uh I had a few sacks, um a lot of assists, uh I want to say at least 10 to 11 tackles for loss. Um so I, I really dominated my freshman year. Um nice. I used to actually um at first I played with no gloves and then I played with gloves. I, I would take my fingers up like Sean Taylor. Yeah. And I had ankle spats. And I hated the first year because they had these Adidas cleats. They were just so big and bulky. Like, it was like walking around with two refrigerators on your feet. And, yeah. you know, I wear a size 16, so mm -hmm. I'm walking around with these big cloggers. It just it just doesn't do it. So, right, right. Um, the next year, they gave, us, they gave the defense lineman a chance to change their cleats to, like, steel cleats. Mm -hmm. So, we did, and that made a big difference. And I literally fly off the edge, um, get to the quarterback in a heartbeat. Yeah. Um I remember Georgia come down to watch one of the spring practices and we mm. were just doing, we were doing board drills and we were doing Oklahoma. Mm. And every guy that came in front of me, every offensive lineman I had in front of me, I buzz them up, left, right, don't mm. make a tackle. And I mean, and I mean, I was really dogging people out. I, yeah. I really was. Um, my coaches, they were really impressed with me. Um, had a lot of high praise there. And then I think my sophomore year, I had a hamstring injury that I had. I had a hamstring injury. And then I had an ankle injury mm -hmm. and that threw me off a little bit there. It slowed up. It slowed up a lot of progress my sophomore year there. Yeah. But as far as, you know, recruitment and coaches and whatnot, still being productive, I was still being productive, but I was a little, I was a little hindered because I actually, I didn't realize this, but I actually like a, I had popped my hamstring. Mm -hmm. I didn't sever it, but I popped it. So when I did, um, it, I had a knot in the back of my hamstring. Mm -hmm. They have to take a massage gun and kind of rub the knot out and try to yeah. break it up over time. And that we used to go, I used to go to uh, PT physical training probably, I don't know, for at least three or four weeks straight, just mm -hmm. them trying to get that knot out. Yeah. And uh, it was tough because it was like at a time where we were having games where we really needed to be like on top of it. Mm -hmm. But my first, my first welcome to college game in junior college was Navarro. Yeah. Navarro is the number one junior college in America. Mm. And uh, these guys were, these guys had gold grills in their mouth, uh, full goatees. I mean, they mm. look like grown men. 
and we and yeah seriously and i we went out we drove instead of flying yeah we drove a bus 18 hours to navarro texas jeez yes so you imagine driving a bus full of guys um you know elbow to elbow shoulder to shoulder mm-hmm. you barely sleep you know a lot of guys were sleeping on each other just like this mm-hmm. it was the most uncomfortable excruciating ride ever and i'll never forget it but you know we had some great moments there so yeah um from junior college to college transition it was just a big difference um the game was the game was slower in junior college mm-hmm. and college the game was faster uh these guys are cut on the dime all the d linemen are quick everyone's strong um explosive i mean all the way down from the kicker i mean we had a kicker on our team that was running a four four i mean Jeez. you know i mean just for uh, the we, heck we, of it you just for the heck of it you know if we wanted to fake it we could <laughs> yeah it's funny because i one thing i i didn't know about football kind of being in it like i I played football for the first time in seventh grade and it was like trying to find something to do after school and doing sports like wrestling was the first thing that was available and then did track and field did a little bit of long distance and then hurdles but then with like football it's like there's so much involved from before you even see the players the the 22 players that are on the field at the time it's like you have the offensive defensive coordinators you have the special teams you have like each positional coach you've got the donors the people that go into the community and then the more it goes out of like that high school level the local level it just grows bigger and bigger and bigger and it's like you don't always get to see that detailed out and kind of expressed and explained and even like the more you grow up you're able to look back at things and be like wow I didn't I didn't realize all the things that were involved but I think your recall is amazing with how you're able to remember what happened to different times. And like, as we even talked about, just like your time in high school, it's, there's so many things I'd forgotten about or so many things I kind of like put behind me to try to move forward and go on to the next thing and the next thing. But then it's like, oh yeah, that did happen. It's like, we, we've lived like all these other lives or all these other things in different parts of our lives. So it, it's good to, to see that. And I, I thank you for, sharing that with me yes sir thank you thank you man i mean uh i mean for from the transition to now it's just yeah. it's been so much it's been so different um and i've seen each phase has had something different mm-hmm. and it's, it's shown me a new way of life yeah a, a new form a new you know a, just a new different a different path mm-hmm. um each door opened up something different and uh be honest, I do it all over again the same way. Yeah. Um, you know, ultimately they say God doesn't make any mistakes, and I don't believe He does. Everything right. happens for a reason. So, uh, you know, being around you guys, going to high school, transferring, then going to college, then going to my my Division One college, um, mm-hmm. all of those were learning experiences for me to to better myself. Mm-hmm. And you're right; you don't really realize what's all incorporated within the sport itself. Um, yeah. There's more to it, you know. There's a, you have local people that help out with it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you have state officials that literally live and die by it. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's it's deep. It's it's got some real deep roots. For sure. I guess for for you, how did how did football end up for you? How did you finish out your college years? Um, I finished out strong. Um, be frank with you. Um. I, I stumbled a little bit in life mm-hmm. afterwards, um, you know, um, being married and whatnot. I had a, a few little proud tribulations, things that, you know, just, I guess really just, I needed a little bit more maturity in some, in some ways. Mm-hmm. But um, I, uh, I was going to the Oakland Raiders. Mm-hmm. Um, they called me, they called my phone and I had a female agent. Her name is Tiffany Porter. Um, mm-hmm. out of Atlanta. Uh, me and Tiffany, we kept in touch and contact and I was doing, Training at Parisi Speed School. I was there with Ethan, Ethan Bennett. Uh, Ethan was, he was my trainer for a little bit. Yeah. Um, I'd work with him. And uh, I remember it was like Thanksgiving 2014, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, my phone got stolen at Walmart at a self checkout. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had to go get a subpoena, a court order subpoena to see the footage of the film to see who stole my phone. 
But in the meantime, I had to go get a phone, a flip phone, just to turn my phone back on. Mm -hmm. So um, I called the number. Um, I got that number canceled, and I got it transferred over to the flip phone. Mm -hmm. I called my number, and I had like 32 missed calls from different NFL teams. Um, I think uh, Jaguars reached out. Um, I can't remember who reached out. Was it Arizona reached out? And then I had like at least 10 or 15 missed calls from uh, Tyvon Branch, player personnel coach for uh, the Oakland Raiders. Hmm. He called me a few times, and then my agent, she called me. And I wasn't able to get to any of it until I got a phone. So if anybody that knows anything, football is a, is a revolving door. Right. Um, one, one guy walks in, another guy walks out. Um, so it's not hard for them to find um, a person that's expendable or replaceable because they can right. replace you in a heartbeat. Um, you might be, you know, 6'6", 295 pounds and could run this way and this and that. But if you don't respond to it or you don't answer to it or whatever, you miss it, you mm -hmm. know, they can go find them a guy that's, you know, 6'3", 260 pounds. They'll do the same thing. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, you know, you can be you can be replaced. And uh, I had missed my opportunity then um, to actually have that chance to go to rookie minicamp. Because I believe I would have went to rookie minicamp and I would have put off enough impression to at least get signed uh, to make a team. Granitedly, I felt like I had the skills and the intangibles to play with those guys. Um, the speed, the size, um, the quickness, um, the nimbleness on my feet. Mm -hmm. And not only that, I had the drive and the wheel too. Um, so I missed that opportunity there. Um, you know, I kicked myself up for a little bit, but ultimately life had to continue on for me. It, it does not stop for anybody. Yeah, um, you can get sick today and be in a hospital for you know, the next four years of your life on life support, mm. but everybody else is still going to be living around. And that's the mindset that I had to have in order to get me out of the slump or the, you know, the negative mindset of thinking, hey, this is the end or this is, you know, this is it. You know, I don't have anything else to offer. And mm. truth be told, I had a lot more to offer. Mm. Um, I'm actually doing that now. So, uh, you know, the, the stuff that I do now, being around trucks and stuff, yeah, um, I give I give credit to that to my grandfather, you know, because I work in a construction area and uh, I pretty much I drive concrete trucks. You know, mm -hmm. I make good money doing that. Uh, it's really simple, easy work. It's yeah. actually kind of fun. <laughs> and every day I meet a new person. Um, yeah. So not only do I get to, uh, you know, indulge in, in their personality and their character, but I need I get to express myself and represent myself to them and let them know me and uh it's good to rub elbows and to network with different people from different types of life yeah because you have some people that were born into this world with a silver spoon or a golden spoon mm -hmm. then you have those that were you know born in the world with no spoon at all and ultimately it's not about how you start it's about how you finish mm -hmm. and i'm really really i'm really living by that in my life right now um i started strong um i had some adversity Mm -hmm. I fell a few times. I dusted myself off. I got back up. And now I'm I'm just now turning, you know, turning the corner. I'm getting ready to hit that 200 meter mark, you know. Yeah. I've still got plenty of room to go, uh, growth. And I feel like uh, this new phase that I'm in in life right now, uh, it's much more crucial and important for me to really fulfill everything I want to do. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing that as a person, um, trying to be a child of God try to uh, give back to people the best mm -hmm. I can. Um, anybody that knows me, you know, half the time I have people tell me, why are you doing that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'll go and I'll give people money um, that I see on the side of the road. If somebody needs food or something, I'll go grab something for them. It just that kind of nature because um, now in this point of life, I realize that I'm a vessel. Mm -hmm. I'm a vessel for God, uh, for the Lord. Whatever he puts on me in my heart to do is what I'll do. And I feel like that, it's teaching me so much more about life in life that I feel like that's the biggest accomplishment I can do is to leave a lasting impression on somebody else right. that you know really needed it. Cause you, you never know who needs a hug at you or yeah. who needs a hello. How you doing today? There's some people that all they want is just somebody to say, Hey, how you doing? Yeah. And they never get that. And you can change somebody's life with the most sim simplicity of things in life, just the smaller things. And, uh, you know, I'm really fortunate to be able to to have that, to have what I have now, my health, mm -hmm. um, my finances, um, the life that I have now. Uh, I'm blessed. And 
I want to try to share that with other people by doing good. So anytime I get to, um, if I could do like a food drive, I would do it. Um, help people in need with rides. Um, I was actually trying to come up with a business plan just on something just to do for, for the city of Dalton, um, for people that, that are really in need. Mm. Um, I know there's some people that are, you know, battling with addiction, uh, depression, um, you know, suicide. Um, there's some that are just less fortunate that don't have anything. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to come up with kind of like a, a blueprint to, to help people in some way, somehow, whether it yeah. may be rides, uh, you know, like a, like a, like a van that just picks people up, has snacks for them, has, you know, waters and just takes them where they need to go. And, you know, it's all paid for through the cost of the city or something, you know, mm -hmm. just to help people. Um, yeah. I think that'd be something neat, you know, to keep a lot of people off the streets. Um, it also would do a lot of good for them. Yeah. Um, so just been thinking just different things, but I'm blessed to be where I'm at now because my mindset from where I was then, you know, I'd always think football is everything. Football is everything. Right, right. You know, um, throughout football, I lost a lot of family. Um, I went through a, a spell where I lost my grandfather that I was very close to in 2017. Mm -hmm. And I was actually trying to play football again. Um, I had a few people reaching out to me and wanted me to really pursue it and go through that route, you know, whether it was um, whether it was AFL, XFL, mm -hmm. or the or the CFL. You know, yeah. I had some plans to do something different. And when my grandfather died, um, that pretty much like the final straw for me. Um, mm -hmm. They caught me by surprise, unexpected. And then I had some family things I had to deal with in the midst of it. So mm -hmm. uh, that was kind of tough on me. So the next two years, uh, you know, of course they say, you know, true love grieves itself. Mm -hmm. So if you lose the one that you really love, you know, nine times out of 10, the other person usually follows behind them. So no less than two years after that, I lost my grandmother. And then the year after that, I lost my uncle. And in 2023, this past year, um, just a month ago, mm -hmm. I lost my closest uncle. And this weekend will be another anniversary for my other uncle. So I went through I went through a little tough spell there. And yeah. I realized that the goal, the mindset, the dream to chase that, it's great. It is. Um, Granted, I had every opportunity and skills to do so, to be there. Mm -hmm. Um but I feel like the path I'm on now, you know, I need to be, I need to spend more time with my family, friends, loved ones, um, yeah. people that really mean something to me. Because, you know, when you have the fortune, the fame, the money, all that stuff, it, it really doesn't mean anything. I've yeah. had, I've had tons of money before and it still hasn't gave me the satisfaction that I get being around my loved ones mm -hmm. or seeing them. Um, yes, money can buy you happiness, but it cannot keep you happiness. Mm. And uh, I really understood that now. So my mission and my goal now is a whole lot different than what it was when I was 22, 23. You know, all I was thinking, NFL, NFL. Yeah. I got to make a million dollars. I got to buy my mom a house. I got to yeah. buy my dad a new truck, take care of my brother. You know, all those things have changed. They're still the same, but they're yeah. in a different form. Um, they're in a much more, uh, you know, godly place. Mm -hmm. um, because honestly, you know, money is the root of all evil, so is greed. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel like God kept me away from it because he probably just didn't want me to be a different person, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that. I feel like he protected me a lot because there's a, there's a lot of times where things have happened where I've just been a minute late, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, 30 seconds from this past, something that just crazily happened. And, uh, you know, I feel like God's been shadowing me, protecting me in a lot of different ways. Mm -hmm. So ultimately he had all this stuff written already. So he knew my path. Yeah. So, uh, so knowing that I can sleep a whole lot better at night, knowing that, you know, he's fulfilling my dreams for me without me even noticing. Mm. That's a great point. I guess, like you said, with the passing of your grandfather, is that what kind of pushed you to embrace life after football? It did. Got it you. did. And that it got did. you to move back to Dalton from Louisiana? Um, I was already here, okay. but I was, uh, I was, there were teams reaching out to me. Um, mm -hmm. um, there's still actually some teams right now reaching out to me. I'm 32 Good. years old. You know, they feel that I can still play or whatnot, but I'm at a point now where, you know, I'm, I'm healthy. I'm, yeah. I, I, I've had no, I've had no ACL injuries, mm -hmm. MCL, no neck problems. Yeah. Um, 
no real broken bone other than, you know, my thumb against Oklahoma State. Mm. So I'm fortunate to have my body intact. I don't have CTE. Right, right. So I'm, I'm blessed. So I think that, and honestly, the way the game is going now, it's changing. Um, I don't know if you watched that game the other night. Um, no, what, what game? Uh, the Ravens and the Chiefs. Um, the, the kickoff, they change the kickoff now where they line up like somewhere, I think it's like four yard line or something like that. They they line up a little bit deeper. They okay. they line up head to head. They don't let they they no longer let the guys run down the field and go make a full speed tackle. And and they're also trying to uh implement the uh the new uh the new safeguards for the helmets. Mm-hmm. So football is gonna actually get a little bit softer over the years. Yeah. It's gonna change. Um and for a lot of guys that played in that gruesome warrior gladiator era, yeah, uh, I feel for them, you know, because there there will be consequences and things I got to deal with, right, throughout the years, you know, pain. Um, there's some guys I know personally that are still aching to this day, mm-hmm. that have that have gave the sport up a long time ago, and I'm one of the guys that's been fortunate not to. So, yeah, hindsight 2020, um, when he passed away, you know, uh, I kind of just try to make a point where. I wanted to do, do a different venture. Um, he wanted me to have my own trucking company. Like he wanted yeah. me to have my own uh, my own record service because I was mm-hmm. towing for a long time. Yeah, and uh, you know he told me that I needed to get a truck and mm-hmm. make my own money and work for myself. So that's something that I'm hoping to do in the future. Yeah. Um, I just want to take everything with a grain of salt. But uh, but yeah, ultimately that that kind of steered me away from that because um, there were times where. I needed to be around him. I needed to come see him. Mm. And I was too busy chasing other things. Mm. And that's what really pumped the brakes on that. So I made sure that I spent a lot more time around my family and friends other than chasing these dreams and aspirations. Right. Um, right. I can still chase those and still get them done. But um, there comes a point in time where family comes first. This this as long as it's God comes first too. Yeah. I think I, I heard someone say once, is like, you have these... Um balls that you're trying to juggle in life and there's a um one of them is a glass ball and the other ones are rubber so it's like the rubber ones can drop whether it's your job whether it's like your passion or this or that but it's like family or friends or some things there's some things that if you drop them they don't come back and like yeah some things are it's um there's there's beauty in the sport and there's there's beauty in different things but we do have some certain systems that work to where, yeah, you are replaceable in a way or another, but it's like what you do, who you are, we can't really substitute that. So it's like better to have you with all your faculties for as long as possible. And even being able to have this conversation, it, it's beautiful because it's something that lives on forever, essentially, or for as long as we are able to view it. And I think it, it does more even in a moment for someone to get to know you to see like, Okay, I didn't I didn't know that about Jalen, right? I didn't realize that this this is all of what goes into a person's life. And I, I hope that it really helps people point a mirror at themselves and learn to appreciate like what they have going on or start writing things down, start talking things out and be able to look and be like, I got a lot more going on than I thought I did. It's like my life isn't all that bad. And you think we talk about maybe a 20 year period, a 30 year period, and like you look forward, it's like you still got another 30 years in front of you, but all you might need to focus on are like the next six months or the next two years. And it's like, it only happens a day at a time. And that's all you can really control. Exactly, man. Exactly. That's that's what I do now. I take it one day at a time, actually. Because, uh, you know, as much as you want to prepare for the future, um, you honestly can't. Yeah. You really honestly can't. You can, you know, yeah, you can grant at least save financially, mm-hmm. but who's to say you save all this money? Yeah, for your kids or for your family or for this big house you want, mm-hmm. and and you die and you never get to live in, you never mm-hmm. get to fulfill that dream, right? You know, somebody has somebody has to take care of those funds or those assets, and whether whether they cared about it as much as you did, they can either forego them, sell them, mm-hmm. or they can you know they can manage them, but ultimately you know these goals and these aspirations we have, um, they're not always so fulfilling because you need to worry about what's the right now. Yeah. The, the the in the moment, you know, mm. you can't be out of the moment thinking, looking ten years ahead because it, it just doesn't pan out. Right, it it never does. That's awesome. 
Yeah, I mean that that's a good point too. And how how are your parents now? Like how are how do you guys spend time together? Uh, we we spend time. Um, my mom she uh she currently she lives in Calhoun, and okay. my dad's still at the residential place um, mm -hmm. at her at her home in Dalton. Mm -hmm. Um, so uh, you know, we uh, anytime we get to get get a chance to get together, uh, try to grab some food. You know, I go see my mom time to time. Mm -hmm. uh, I see my dad just about every other day. We kind of work together. Yeah. Um. So so that's pretty neat. Um, getting to see him and work with him, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much how we do things. Um, of course we have cookouts so like that, but um, yeah. The biggest the biggest blessing is just still having them both. You know, there's a lot of guys I went to school with that lost a father, yeah. lost a mother. Um, and for me to be 32 and still have mine, um, it's a blessing that I just can't overlook. Yeah. Um, Cause I know the day comes that I do lose them. You know, I, I'd probably be a little bit different person. You know, a piece of me would probably be gone. Mm -hmm. So that's a good point. Well, I appreciate your time today. I, I won't keep you much longer. Um, but one way I'd like to ask two questions if you'd like anyone to follow you or reach out to you, whether it's to look at the business idea that you talked about with um, taking care of people, getting people off the street in Dalton, Georgia, like how would you like people to get in touch with you? Um, you can uh, you can Facebook me. Um, of course, anybody's interested, um, they can message me. Um, uh, my email, it's um, jalenfields1312 at gmail.com. Um, feel free to message me there with any kind of um, ideas or, you know, different intangibles you think that I can probably add on to the business. Um, anybody that's want to help uh, wants to be in a movement like this um, as far as doing positive for the city and for the people because, you know, Dalton's building houses like crazy, but mm. um, the economy is so bad right now that almost, you know, if you don't, if you don't own a house, really, um, you probably won't be able to get one right now, to be honest with you just because of the simple fact that everything's so high. And then if you rent somewhere, nine times out of 10, you got to pay the deposit, which is the same price as the rent. Right. So you pretty much at least got to have, you know, three or four grand in hand to move somewhere. Yep. And there's a lot of people out here that are suffering. Um, I remember the downtown in Dalton used to be a bad place um, mm -hmm. where a lot of people were homeless and stuff. And there's still people under the bridge that are struggling. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I just feel like, if you really want to make a positive impact or do something in a positive manner and try to take Dalton and turn around in a different direction, um, definitely reach out to me. Um, any idea, I'm open. I'm always available to listen. Um, and uh, not only does, you know, their ideas benefit me, but um, it'll benefit the society and community. So anything that you can think of positive, regardless if it doesn't even concern, you know, dealing with picking up people, just mm -hmm. something that, can change the narrative around here. Um, I'd really love to be involved with that. Awesome. And from the very first question I asked you, are you still who you said you were? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I still am. Um, I still have high faith, praising the Lord. Um, still humble, still family guy. Uh, love family, friends. Um, anybody in need, if I see somebody in need walking, um, I'd help out. Um, not too long ago, just to not to hold you up either, because I know you've got things to do, but uh, no, you're good. There was a guy. Um, he was actually uh, he was shunned by a few people. Mm. Um, he was asking for a ride, and you know, a lot of people judge a book by its cover without even reading the first page. Mm. And I didn't. Um, I decided to open the book and read it. So I rolled down the window politely, said, "Hey, uh, so do you need a ride or something?" He said, "Yes." You know, I said, "Where are you going?" And he said, well, I'm going right here. I said, okay, well, I can take you there for you. And uh, he got in the truck. I rode with him. And he's like, well, he said, you know, I didn't want to bother you or pester you that much. He said, but do you think you can go on a little bit further down the road? And I said, that's really where I need to go. He said, but I was just trying to get a ride somewhere close to the vicinity so I could walk the rest of the way. And I said, no, man. I said, I'll take you the, I'll take you the whole way home. And uh, I took the guy home. Um, really nice guy. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened was he had left his glasses at home. Mm -hmm. and he was partially blind, so he really couldn't see that well. Mm -hmm. So the people he was walking up to, he was walking up to him like this, like, hey, he was talking to him, but he really couldn't see him that well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, he didn't really know who I was. All he knew was my skin complexion. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the first thing he said, man, he said, uh, when he got out the truck, he said, God bless you. He said, you know, he said, I know a lot of people are judging him out here and whatnot. 
and uh, you know, based off you know color and background and stuff you said, but you know, you you really made my night. Um, this was really special for you to help me out. Thank you so much. If there's any way I can pay you back, I will. I said if you let me go inside and grab my glasses, you know, I can get a, a better look at you and see you. So uh, he ran, and grabbed his glasses, and he saw me, and we introduced ourselves to each other. He said, "Thank you so much, man." And uh, I said, "No problem." He said, "God bless you." You know, it was just kind of like a wholesome moment. Like everybody was thinking this guy was going to hurt somebody. You know, I'm a big guy. I can yeah. take care of myself. I, I really wasn't worried about that. But right, right. Everybody else is thinking like, you know, this guy's a a junkie, or you know, he's trying to do something to me. Mm -hmm. Granted, the guy sincerely, honestly, left his glasses at home. He could not see. Mm -hmm. You know, but everybody was judging him, and I took the benefit of the doubt. And I took the risk on my life and his life, and went along and brought him along. Mm -hmm. And it was as simple as that. Right. You know that that right there was a real wholesome moment for me. It just showed me like you can't just judge people. You can't. You can't go out here just you know just because this guy has a hole in one of his socks. You can't sit there and say that he's dirty or you don't know what he goes through. You mm -hmm. don't know. You don't know his finances. You don't know his background. You don't know his supporting cast or even if he has a supporting cast of people. Mm -hmm. So uh, that just taught me a lot there. And uh, still to this day, man, I'm the same person. Anybody in need, I help you the best I can to my abilities. If, if I've got it, I've got it. If I don't have it, I'll find a way to try to get it for you. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's just something I live by. You know, I want to do good to people. Um, something ever happens to me or I die and pass on. I just want people to know that I was I was extremely humble, um, hardworking, um, loving, dedicated, a uh, genuine good person from the soul and the heart, mm -hmm. and that um, any good that I could do possibly in the world, I would love to do. I, that's my ultimate aspiration. If I can't, if I can't do the other things in life, I can at least make somebody else's life better. Right. And uh, that's the way I want to be remembered. You know, it's knowing that hey, you know, you know he. He was a great person, and he would also do great things for other people. Mm. And that's ultimately, you know, they say that they say that on that tombstone, you know, that that beginning date when you were born in that asterisk is mm -hmm. what you did between that between those two times. Yeah. And uh, I want that asterisk to represent greatness. Mm -hmm. I do. You know, I know I won't always be perfect. I know there'll be times that I'm wrong, or I make mistakes, or make ill-advised decisions. But ultimately, I want people to know that wholeheartedly you know i'm a good person and yeah. i want to be good for other people well thank you for being the big teddy bear you are jalen and uh i appreciate it i wish you a great week and thank you so much for having this conversation with me no problem brother love you man love you too